So this would be a great moment for you to look at the target questions that emerged out of your experience of the readings. Does that make sense? So you don't, you're not obligated to share your target question with everyone, uh, especially if someone else has already offered the target question more or less that you're interested in. Um, so, who has got a target question? So, imagine. Okay, let's bring it, bring it here. Imagine a world that makes you uncomfortable. Imagine a world. Maybe you're fine, but maybe there are people around you that you care about. Imagine a world is disturbingly uncomfortable for either you or others. And it makes you feel uncomfortable. And you define it. So there's something about the world that you wish were different. Right? And how many people think the world is fine the way it is? Okay, that's healthy. Um, how many people think it's hopeless that there's really nothing that we can do to it? Okay, we're here to help. Um, let's address that first, because I think we all have moments of hopelessness. And I'm embarrassed to confess that I used to contribute to that feeling of hopelessness. Here's how I contributed directly to the feeling of hopelessness. I taught this class, believe it or not, in a way that's similar to the way teachers taught me. They started with the dawn of human civilizations and the whole class gets all relaxed and moves into a passive mode of engagement. Then I moved through history century by century, decade by decade, creeping up towards the present time. But because the closer we get to the present, the more difficult it is to understand what's going on. There's a tendency in the faculty, those of us who teach in this world, there's a tendency to pause, to postpone, to delay, to be vague. And you experience this too, right? I think we're guilty of doing that to a certain extent in the History Theory 2 course, and I apologize for it. But let's get back to this course. When you teach the history of cities, starting from the dawn of civilization and moving step by step towards the present, inevitably you run out of time the studio professors and the students and the department chairs all say, hey, can you just cancel the last week of class because studio, you know, studio. And we say, yes, thank you, okay. It relieves us from the most um, the riskiest part of our job, which is attempting to characterize the present and the future. And even when we do, let's say we actually do rush to the end and say, here's the situation now today. It's hard to finish the semester. It's hard to finish the course on a positive route. There's a sense of hopelessness and helplessness that is the inevitable outcome of this approach. And because that didn't feel right, some of us started teaching it differently. We don't want the students to go in passive mode as much as possible. We don't want to, we certainly don't want to leave students with a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. What we do want to do is fill our mission 
as educators to support, to meet students where you're at, wherever you're at. Our job is to meet you where you're at and take you from where you are up to a place where you don't feel hopeless and helpless, where you actually feel excited about being a design professional, about being an architect with the skills, with the knowledge, with the perspective, with the tools to actually identify moments of truth, opportunities for shifting the situation and turning things in a better direction. And I don't know if that's come through in the course thus far, but that is the underlying uh, principle behind the entire course. That's why we teach it backwards. That's why I ask you at the beginning of the class for target questions. I want to activate you as participants and partners in this journey. I want you to challenge me to meet you where you're at and bring you to a place where you feel like, yes, as an architect, I can actually do something to turn it around, to actually make a difference, to change the situation. Any questions or comments? So that's the that's kind of the overarching logic course that changes everything. It changes how we start today. It changes it makes us, it requires us to ask for target questions. And as usual, your target question, the thing you might be uncomfortable about, is not out there in Jakarta or China or uh, the gated enclaves that uh, Graham and Mark are ready about. It could be that the thing you're uncomfortable about is the way this course grades, the way these assignments are given and how do you still have questions about the analysis or you still have questions about the sketchbook. So those are good questions as well. And, and maybe that's where we start. Do you have target questions? How can I, how can you help me meet you where you're at and bring you to the place where the sketch writing and the analysis is just easy? If you can imagine such a thing, it's just like breathing. Inhale, exhale. You read the thing, inhale. You write sketch writing, exhale. It's just a habit of the mind. So let's start with sketch writing. And let me say one other thing. There's a lot in the press about chat GPT and computers. And we thought when the internet emerged, we thought that all of a sudden, not just students, but everybody would be so much more productive because we have instantaneous access to all the knowledge in the world through a box in our pockets. That is revolutionary. And what we thought was going to happen is that uh, with all that knowledge available, we would become so much more empowered, so much more productive, so much clearer that path forward that uh, things would open up, the possibilities would open up, and we'd all be, uh, we'd help, we'd work together to make a much better world for this path. But something else happened as an unintended, unexpected consequence is that these little boxes in our pockets, all these rectangular glowing things in our lives, all our attention, they distract us and they shorten our attention span. And so the social scientists have indicated that, that sure, there may be an increase in uh, the availability of knowledge and information, but there's also kind of a parallel inverse decrease in our capacity to focus and make sense of the world. So if that's the big question looming over our engagement with technology in 2023, some of us believe the answer to that challenge are tools and habits like sketch writing. Because it, it works against these short attention span problems. You can actually 
instead of sitting down and starting to read a 25 page piece of writing, you are, you, you sit down and you ask yourself, how much time do I want to spend on this? And what do I need to get out of it? What's your target question for this reading? And then that activates you. You go in and you're like a burglar who's broken into a wealthy person's house. And you trigger the alarm and the police are coming. You only have five minutes to get in and get out. That's what it should feel like when you do sketch writing. The police are on their way. You've always wanted a really that 4K television on the wall. As in, you've always wanted to understand regime theory. Right. In machine theory, that sounds kind of cool. I really like understanding. If you don't have time to understand machine theory. You figure out the, the simplest version of what machine theory is, and then you get out. Right? You don't go for the plasma, the, the 4K TV on the wall. It's too big. It doesn't even fit out the window. If you have to leave. So you go for the jewels, you go for the cash, put it in your pocket, and you get out. Right? <laughs> Sketch writing is the solution, is the answer to the question, what do we do in an era of shortened time frames for doing anything shorter attention span? What's the answer? Sketch writing. It should feel like a very efficient way to take in a lot in a short amount of time. And we've superpowered it as starting last year, this whole group production of sketch writing. That's new. It came from your the students who took this class last year. They said, hey, how about if we organize ourselves and we collaborate on this? Because it's so time consuming to paraphrase. It's very difficult to paraphrase. So let's break it up and do a team paraphrasing exercise. So that's the idea of the sketch writing. So are you comfortable with the sketch writing or do you have target questions? Because we're going to be doing it. Living school. You like the sketch writing, you don't like the sketch. Everybody raise their hand. Uh, and I'm going to ask you at a certain point to everybody put your thumb up or everybody put your thumb up. Or you can put it sideways. Okay. So, I, but I need first everyone's arm should be in the air. Now, thumb up or thumb down, or sideways. For, for the sketch writing, we like the sketch writing. We don't like the sketch writing. We got some thumbs up. We got some sideways. We got a big thumb down. Wow. Not many thumbs down. Okay, if you put your thumb down, everybody, thank you. If you put your thumb down, do you have a question? Are you uncomfortable with the sketch writing? Okay, if you put your thumb sideways or down, what would help make you more comfortable? What would make the sketch writing something? Like how could we change it? Or do you have a question about? Is it taking too much time? Yes. I think more than anything, we already resolved it in the WhatsApp of actually having a table of contents for more. Yes. So you would like that ahead of time. So yes, I want to see that. So does that sound good? We we organize it ahead of time as in either we used to have student editors who did that. We we could do that or I could do it. So do you like that? You like to arrange the pages ahead of time because it's just too much turbulence. We'll see. You like that? Do you like sticking with the groups you're in? Yes. And if, uh, if Christina can't make it this week because she's sick, is it okay to do it on your own? I, 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 I like to know Okay. And that's okay? That's okay. So, so should the groups be locked and I use the bright space in the way it was designed? Or should I keep doing what I'm doing, which means you can, like, you can switch groups when the steam is up? 
keep doing what we're doing. And just have like a list of all of the page numbers that you can write our names next to them. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I'll break it into logical chunks and uh, you guys can self assign. Okay. I like that. Let's see how that goes. And if you have new ideas, we can change them. So, anything else about the sketch writing? Now let's drill in, because this is part of sketch writing and analysis. What's this whole thing about bibliography and note citation? They're the same thing, right? The bibliography is the note citation, and the note citation is the bibliography, right? Right? Is that, are they the same thing? The bibliography is the whole thing, and the citation is for white. The bibliography is the reading. It might be the book. And it's what you do at the end of whatever you're, you're whatever you're producing in terms of a report or something. We saying here's some sources that you guys, you the readers, might be interested in looking because I found it useful. Boom. Alphabetized list of sources. Last name first, first name last. So it's an alphabetized list. The note citation is a totally different animal that performs a completely different function. I'm writing my, I'm, I'm making my logical sequence of five points. And it was use, it's useful to refer to the fact that the guy who built this monument in the car of Senegal, uh, he did it for these purposes, right? It's, you, you don't see that in the image, you can't, but in order, once you know that, it helps us interpret it more effectively. Footnote, and that's on page 17 of this journal article uh, in this year, in this journal, by these authors, right? So it's a specific reference to a source where this information comes from. The other where place the, the load citation format comes in handy is saying this analysis that I did, this image is from this source. So everyone needs to embrace this reality. The bibliography is last name first, first name last, and each item in the bibliography is separated by periods. Each, you know, the, the title, the place of publication, period. The, you know, it's all got periods and then there's a period at the end. Whereas the image source, the image source in your caption and your footnote citation has commas. There's commas throughout the whole thing because it's kind of like a sentence. And some of you, have totally mastered this. And the rest of you should work with them. So I don't know how Narvina, Brianna, and Pete know all these things, but you've got it, right? So I and a bunch of a bunch more people. I, I didn't memorize everyone who seems to know this perfectly well. But if you have any questions, ask one of your classmates, especially them. Okay. You have any questions about that? It would be great if you shut me down from the business of uh, taking off points uh, for, for not getting this right. We don't use bibliography so much, uh, but we're doing it in sketch writing, so we become aware of the difference between bibliography format and note citation format. Note citation format, lots of commas. Bibliography format, lots of periods. It's more specific than that, but I'm just giving you a general guide. And the commas go inside the quotation marks here in the United States. We're the only country in the world that's our punctuation inside the quotation marks. It's weird, it doesn't make sense. As designers, we find it offensive. But it is the convention of architectural practice in North America, by not North America, in the United States, Canada, the punctuation goes outside. But while you're doing what you're doing in the United States, 
to punctuation inside of quotation marks. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's move on to the analysis. You're going to have to do another analysis, this time including video. What uh, what questions do you have that would help you succeed in the analysis? Yes. So I saw that the topic for versus which is it for the image? Is it more like, for example, for that's a great question. So the topic for this week, what kind of image are we looking for? My recommendation is extreme wealth adjacent to relative lack of wealth and the architectural condition between those two. And this, uh, all, already all the way through this course, we're very sensitive to the spaces around the interventions that we're looking at. We want to see in your highlighting your choice of image. We want to see a circulation pattern. We want to see the sidewalks versus the streets where the traffic is flowing, and the pathways and the gateways and the doorways. And if the if the library park King of Spain in Medellin, Colombia, if that were surrounded by razor wire, which is a guard post and uh, armored vehicles it would mean something totally different than if it's an open park with children playing and no division between the self-produced households and the park and the like. Changes everything. So we, this week, we want to specifically look at the nature of the, the architecture of that edge, that boundary. It establishes the relationship between Zones of relative wealth and zones of relative wealth. That's it. This, I'm just thinking about what kind of image this is the best suited for this. And I know that we've talked about having an image that's kind of close to the ground, we can see scale figures. Are we able to do something more higher up to get that full understanding of how drastic the change is? Yeah, if the image that you find is from above, as in the website unequal, what's it called? Unequal, unequal cities. Someone look it up. Who's got a computer? Oh, well, I'll have to do it. Someone could look up unequal cities. I think that's what it's called. It's a great resource for identifying the kinds of places we're looking for. Unfortunately, they're not, what's it called? The website? What's it? Are you asking Yeah, there's a website. I think it's called Unequal Cities or Divided. Do an image search on Unequal. I think it shows up. But they're not. Architects, I don't see. They're they're fine with these satellite images straight overhead. They but they have identified lots of really useful locations where these extreme uh, divides occur. That's a useful resource to identify places, but then you can then go further and find the kind of images they give us as human scale activity in the foreground. Because we're architects and we're interested in what it's, we, we need to look at and explore and understand how the architecture alters the human experience on the ground. Oh. Unequal cities? Unequal scenes. Unequal scenes. And what kind of images do they have there? It's a top down area. Yeah. So, um, what do we do when we have top-down views that don't quite give us the unit scale in the foreground? Or we have views from the ground that don't give us the top-down view? Here's what we do. We, we look 
can check and make sure there's no image that captures both of those at the same time. And or if once if, if, if there's a weakness, we favor the image that shows the human scale experience. And then we put the inset into, into the, the main image. Like, like here's one. This is on the ground. This gives us a sense of what it's like on the ground. Then complement that with a smaller image. This is the one you analyze. And this is the one, the top-down view, that shows street grid um, of the informal settlement. And you don't analyze that one. You simply give this as a context setting. Does that make sense? And then in the video, you might go from one to the other and try as best you can to piece together the relationship between the human scale activity on the ground and the foreground and the large, its relationship to the larger urban situation. It's harder to do, but uh, you can really want to dig into that example. There's no single image that does the job adequately. That's how you get it. That makes sense. Jesse. I think you can ask I have a thought you were asking us for the library. Oh, okay. Did you did you have the answer? All right. Awesome. So what else with the analysis? Here's the hint. <clears throat> We usually don't have to worry about chat GPT. And we don't have to worry about plagiarism in this paradigm. Why? Because the point of this, it's not like the kind of writing we did in high school. We, we're not asking you to look in things and read things and learn about things and then report it to us. If we were doing that, then Chat GPT is, might, might work uh, in a pinch if you have no time, if you want to get it done quick. Or plagiarism is an option. Uh, you can get away with it. But our systems check and don't allow you to do that. They alert us when there's any plagiarism. It even alerts us when there's a suspect chat GPT. But we don't have to worry about that because if you've read the instructions for the assignment, if you understand what the purpose of this assignment is, chat GPT and plagiarism don't come into it. It's not even tempting. There is no existing text that does what this text needs to do. This text is not a report on the site that we're looking at. It's not a report. Please keep your information to yourself. We don't care that you read all this stuff and you are going to report to us. It was built in this year and, and this is the program and it's next to this program. We don't care. That's not the assignment. Don't write that. What do we care about? We care about the drawing. We care about what we're looking at and what you discover as you explore it. This assignment is to generate five solid sentences that says this relationship between people's interiors and their exteriors, they have furniture and chairs inside and they have furniture and chairs outside and their living space inside directly connects to the living space outline, outside, which expands the constrained space of the interior. So and what's the impact? So I just described an architectural situation where the inside expands to the outside. That's the architectural situation. What does that situation do? What's the impact? So every sentence of those five middle sentences should be that type of a sentence. This architectural situation of furniture inside, open door, furniture outside, what does it do? This is the second part of the sentence, and the most important part of the paragraph is the second part of every sentence. It expands the available living space out into the street. Boom. 
That's what it does. The next sentence moves on and says, as each household expands their living space out into the street, it creates a shared social space that produces this coherent social community of neighbors who know each other and the children grow up as if they're brothers and sisters running in and out of each other's houses. So this architectural situation produces a social outcome. So those five sentences should do that. And then I'm just ad-libbing here because I didn't think about this beforehand, but uh, in order to make sense of this, what's going on here, it might be useful to give a, a portrayal of the larger situation that although these are all self-built, self-produced homes in a self-produced community, the local government protects them from dislocation. So that's the, and then I put a footnote, that's the background information that allows us to interpret the architecture clearly and be able to make sense of what we're seeing more effectively. That's the institutional arrangement that sheds light on the formal spatial arrangement. Every sentence should say this formal spatial arrangement has this architectural impact on the users. And then somewhere in those five sentences, you should uh, add additional information that, that helps us interpret this using an understanding that comes from beyond just the image. That's the footnote. Does that make sense? So we usually, as, as soon as you have an, an understanding that that's why we're doing this, that's the purpose of this, we, all of a sudden plagiarism and chat GPT just goes away. We don't care. It doesn't help. You know, if you're giving us a report, you're going to get one out of four points on the relationship between the evidence and the argument. And you know, but if, if the machine detects plagiarism in chat GPT, then you get a zero for the whole thing. So um, if you don't have time to do it right, just write a paragraph and get one from now until the end of the semester. Yes. Uh, and I think you always have the freedom to choose your own picture. Yeah, I was saying the first week, first two weeks, do a meeting on the uh, library part just to make it easier for you. But now, um, and if I choose to do something that ends up having nothing to do with the weekly topic, how, what's the penalty for missing the weekly topic? Might be one point out of 24. Once you commit, this is part I was uh, trying to emphasize previously. Once you, it's hard to choose an image, but once you choose an image, friends don't let friends second guess, right? Once you commit to an image, just interpret what that image is telling us, even if it has nothing to do with the topic that we Because otherwise, you choose an image, you start analyzing it, and say, ah, I don't like this one. You go back, choose another image, you start analyzing it and say, ah, I don't like this one. I don't want you to go through that. I want you to have the freedom to follow your gut, choose an image, even if it's not the right topic, just choose an image, commit to it, extract what you can out of it. And there's minimum loss. One point. Did everyone hear that question? Can we use images from the, the readings that we did the scheduling? Can we put footnotes uh, that refer to the text that we sketch wrote about? Yes and yes. Um, you're not footnoting the sketch writing, you're footnoting uh, Grand and Marvin splintering urbans. So they said this, um, and you're accessing all of these images and ideas through the sketch writing that you might have might be from a part of the sketch writing that you produced, or it might be from part of the sketch writing that 
someone else moves. But it's all available to all of us. So these two assignments start to come together. And this is the kind of inhale, exhale kind of experience that we hope you achieve uh, in this course. So we spend less time looking at punctuation equipment and more time looking at what architects can do to alter the situation. That becomes our focus. Once we get these skills down, we can then turn our attention more fully to what we can do when, when we get to studio. Okay, questions about analysis. Questions about this week's analysis. Questions about the caption. For or just in general, do you have to, can you get your own off the Yes. Okay, that's it. You mean from above? Like if you want, say you can't find the street view that you want, uh, and you want to go to the app so you get a street view. Or street the image, view. yeah. To support as a secondary yes. image, as a secondary image, you can do anything. You can even do. Remember how I said, don't do architectural drawings and don't do diagrams. That's for your primary image. For secondary images, if you want to put up the diagram, that's okay. It helps us understand the primary analysis image. That's great. Uh, if you think that the secondary image, think if it's useful to analyze two images and do all the colored shapes on two images, please don't. That's so time consuming. It's, it's hard enough to do one image properly, right? It takes so much time. And even when I spend hours, uh, I don't get full credit for that. That's really hard. Yes, it's really hard. Don't divide your time between two images, choose the one. The words best and make that the focus of your analysis. Okay. Anything else on the analysis? Questions about how do I make a video? The easiest way to make a video, the students tell me, is I get my image, I ask myself, what's the primary thing that jumps out at me? And I use my color, I use my uh, mad, mad skills in Photoshop, quick select tools, and I do yellow over the street map or something. And then I take a screenshot. Then I say, okay, there's, these, uh, there's this primary intervention and there's a bold roof form and, and I take another screenshot and then I'd say, and then there's a window pattern. And I'd take another screenshot. And then if I had more colors, I'd say, and then there's the uh, surrounding condition of the, the gateway and the walls. And take another screenshot. And so you can take these multiple screenshots as you produce the analysis image. You can set that into a slideshow. And then you can turn on the Zoom and record uh, your, your presentation with the slideshow <laughs> as you read your uh, uh, seventh sentence card. And you can slip into the slideshow secondary images that show you know, the view from above, the view from the street, the diagram. All of that can be in your slideshow. And be surprised how much you can do with 60 seconds of the Yes. So we're submitting the video as well as the PDF document itself. Yes, we're submitting the PDF document as always and a one minute more or less video. Questions about that? What if I hate my voice? What if I hate the sound of my voice? Can I use the machine synthesizing? 
place. No, you cannot. It's okay. The voice, believe it or not, the voice does sound like that. We really love it. We really love your voice. Okay, you hear yourself. It, it sounds played. I don't know why it's so painful to hear your own voice. It sounds wonderful. Give yourself a hug and just do it. Or you, I, I think it's okay if you have a buddy who does the voiceover for you and you do the voiceover for your buddy if you want to do that. But shouldn't be your voice. Okay, is that enough? Have we, have we done enough here? Okay. How many people, let's do the whole tongue thing again. Should have done this at the beginning of the analysis discussion. Everyone raise your hand. We'll continue when everyone's hand is up. Okay. Now we need a thumb up on the analysis, thumb down on the analysis, thumb sideways on the analysis. Okay. So that's great. Thank you. And if it's sideways or down, do you have something to ask or suggest? <laughs> yeah. um, can you explain the specifics of the video more? Video will help with that too because we're recording the show. They show us how to not to play these steps. You guys are so much better at this than I am. I've, I've attempted to do it live in person in front of class and I it's just so time consuming because I'm fumbling also because I'm already recording the video. Um yeah some of they use different things. Who knows how to do a video? Who's got an idea? What do you suggest? Um, I think I or using something like we all have access to like After Effects when you just like After Effects and record over it. Wow, <laughs> that's fancy. But it's just a slideshow and then press record. Slideshow? Or just like turn on. Or no, I oh, yeah, you could do that too. That way, but you just make a couple images. Put the fade between the slides, and then you have like an image with one color, an image with both colors, etc. You export each like layer as its own image, and you, you record your screen. And then you click through the slideshow of each of the Some people do uh, record the, the slideshow video. Well, it's not a slideshow, they record uh, the screen, they do a screen capture with Photoshop on. And they click on the layers as they go. That's another way to do it. But I like the slide approach because then you can slip in secondary images up to one third of the total time of the video. Remember that rule? Yes. Why can't we revise our analysis after we get feedback on it if we want to? You can, it's just that the regrading opens a Pandora's box of everyone pursuing a perfect score. And it just, it's, isn't this class enough work already? I used to do that, but I was told, you know what? Just stop it. You're killing the rest of us. I think this might be my opinion, but I feel like I'd like an optional one more chance at it. If uh, like I absolutely missed the mark, I realized I missed the mark after the fact, but I feel like I can get it this next time. Uh -huh. I personally would like the optional chance to do so, so that I feel like I understand it more, and okay. I feel like I have a great that makes sense for what I think I understand. Uh, so you want to do it and to be graded? I want, to do, it, I want to do it for my own knowledge, but I also recognize that. I only have so much time to give and I don't, I would, I don't have, it's not, I don't know how to say it eloquently, but I feel like I need to be rebraded on it in order to feel like I actually, I don't know. Actually have 
accomplished and, yeah. and get acknowledged for having accomplished what I did. Okay. Um, how many people would like a chance to redo the analysis for a better grade? Oh man! I used here's what I used to do. I used to say, I used to announce to the class, anyone who wants to can redo the work as many times as they want. As many times as you redo it, I will regrade it, and that has worked out really well. Some students have done it over and over and over again, and one student ended up publishing his work, getting a full tuition scholarship to Oxford and Harvard and doing his PhD, now he's a famous person. He went from uh, being kicked out of the graduate program where I was teaching at the time uh, to becoming a giant in the field. And he did that by redoing his work six times until it was publishable and he published it, right? Uh, and then he published everything he ever wrote in school. And the reason I was able to lavish that attention is that no one else was interested. And I know you're interested, but I suspect that only a fraction of those of you who raised your hand are actually going to take the time because you're going to do fine in these spots. I feel like people are doing it for the creators. There's no downside to, they're still going to learn something, even if they're just doing it. Well, that's why we do grades, is to kind of. So um, let me check with uh, my colleagues who kind of said, you got to stop doing this. You're killing us. Um, I'll check because there's, there's uh, two other concentration studies courses. This is really kind of a third of those three. So let me check with them to see if they're okay with doing that. Okay. Okay. What else? If you're worried about your grade, you are not the first group that's been worried about their grade. But unlike other courses, this is something we do uh, this assignment 12 times. And the first 11 times you do it, it's kind of practice. Because the 12th time you do it, it's the term project. And all of a sudden, it's worth a lot of points. So in a way, the grading structure and the percentages are a way to coax you into becoming comfortable and familiar and stacking up the high scores near the end of the semester and then just hitting the ball out of the park when it matters, when it's the World Series of Analysis Assignments and the points uh, are much higher and that's when you, you lock down the age of the course. So that's kind of the game theory approach to the game. Okay. Okay, is that enough on sketch writing and analysis? Okay, let's look at the target questions that came out of the reading. What do we need to know about this topic? And just back to the reference point, we there are things that architects can do to alter the way this plays out. So these readings make it appear hopeless and make us appear helpless. But the, the whole trick here is to identify the way these forces operate in relationship to each other, identify the design component of these forces and insert ourselves at that moment true and turn it around and make it work in our favor. And that's what we're trying to do. So what are the target questions that would help you identify where the key acupuncture points are? Where we can hope design, good design into that point and turn things around. What are your target questions? Yes. 
How does the redevelopment of cities impact surrounding neighborhoods? How do we improve curb appeal in the city while still serving its efforts? Um, to improve the appeal and uh, and conditions for all for the most people. The majority. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, can like culture be artificially created? Can culture be artificially created? And I'm going to um, put the quotes around artificial. So that's kind of judgmental. Culture, that's how culture works. These are good target questions. Yes. So, uh, what are governments doing today to prevent the vertical slide of ownership? Well, how about what can governments do to prevent? And what do you mean by the vertical slide? Uh, like the monopolization of the ownership of the city. So, maybe um, monopoly ownership. And the financialization of space. Financialization of the built environment. Yeah. Um, this one was kind of like, how does brick and mortar affect spending habits, which is kind of similar to the culture one. But... Yeah. Specifically, consum consumer choice. Yeah. How does built environment? impact consumer choices, consumption. Because consumption is where the rubber hits the road. How to shift government priorities. to more favorable outcomes for the urban majority. Is that okay? Yes. How can how so I think this is a million dollar question. How do we improve neighborhoods without causing gentrification and displacement? To increase time. The others? Okay, these are really good. So, um, so I want to circle back to last week's topic, because there was a very positive story that we didn't have time for in the lecture that I think is useful. And it's something I was asked to present uh, a few weeks ago uh, to uh, an international group convening over the past 10 months that I was participating in in person when I was living in Barcelona last fall. I was attending these events. Uh, and it includes a lot of colleagues and friends of mine from Barcelona and Caracas, Venezuela. They asked me to present. And so these are a few slides. And um, it's a very positive story that exemplifies what can happen when you take the, the methods of informal settlements, of self-produced neighborhoods, 
and you apply it to a disaster situation, which I told some of you about on Thursday. Uh, so I want to just put some images to that story. This is a uh, self-produced neighborhood in uh, Solo, Java, Indonesia, where I lived for four years. Uh, the, just I needed a place to live. I, I graduated from architecture school. Uh, I worked at IMP Associates, and then I worked in San Francisco for several firms. And then the recession came across the country. Mark Mulligan and I are almost exactly the same age. He went to, to Japan to practice to escape the recession. And I accepted a three month grant to study the interplay between culture and space in uh, Java, the island of Java, Indonesia. I was able, it was so inexpensive to live in this informal settlement in this city, this very large city in central Java, that I was able to stretch my three month grant to a year and a half. And, and in, during that time, I started volunteering, helping out the royal family and uh, of this impoverished kingdom that had its palace complex was falling to pieces. And so I worked with them to raise money for the, for the uh, restoration of the palace. Um, and so I spent four years living in this community in Java in an informal settlement. And it was wonderful. Sometimes it stank. Sometimes my neighbors uh, met me on my patio and very politely asked for money to help them out because their husband broke their arm and can't work and they have to keep the kids in school and very politely asked me for support. And even though I was living on almost nothing, I was paying $13 a month in rent. I was getting all you can eat meals, the best food you've ever had for 70 cents on the street sellers. It was wonderful. And the people were fantastic. And it really did feel like this. Everyone hanging out and laughing and joking and playing games and children playing and watching TV with the guys late at night. It was just fantastic. Um, so from that experience, I learned uh, a lot about the actual mechanisms of self-produced communities by living in one. I didn't go there to learn about self-produced communities. No one cared when I was going to architecture school. It wasn't a thing. I didn't even know what slums or informal settlements were. I just needed a place to live, and I found a great place to live in an informal settlement. Turns out we care. We care about it so much. We even study it in architecture school now. We hire faculty based on their research into informality, uh, as we did with Ignacio Cardona. So Hota Samper, who was part of our Designing for Life event in 2008, has gone on to create an atlas of informality and it's a valuable resource for understanding this kind of global variety because every informal settlement has its own brilliant strategies for doing things. And this is kind of a catalog of all those. Um, in different places, they have different names for it. Um, a lot of this is in Spanish, sorry about that, except for those of you who speak Spanish. Um, So the, um, one of the last things I did at this palace was I helped the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, one of the most prestigious architectural awards that you've heard of it. There's the Pritzker and there's uh, other awards. This is up there with the Pritzker. And instead of just awarding the shiniest and flashiest bold formal uh, creations uh, by Zaha Hadid, they actually look at 10 years after the architectural intervention happens, 
what has the impact been on the, the users, on the community? And so they find themselves actually granting awards to projects that are not flashy, like the Kampong Improvement Project that won in 1980, where the government, what they would do is they would say, listen, you guys run your own neighborhood. We're not going to come in and bulldoze your houses and improve your houses. We're just going to leave you with some bags of concrete, of cement, some, some piles of gravel and sand, some concrete blocks, and some rebar. And we're going to send in a, a building expert. And together with that building expert, you, the community, you're going to dig drainage canals along every walkway. And you're going to take your muddy paths and create proper paved streets so you don't uh, and pop proper sanitation and drainage and water supply. So they're going to retrofit infrastructure into the self-produced communities through further self-production. They're not saying self-production is a failed approach. They're saying self-production is the key to success. And the Dutch colonial powers did it in 1907. The Indonesian government did it in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, the punchline of this story is that uh, it continued and was used uh, in response to the third largest earthquake and tsunami in human history in Sumatra. So these are self-help projects that continue to go on throughout uh, Indonesia, where the community is tying rebar. The community with training, with help from trained builders, are constructing bridges in their, their little self-produced communities for the benefit of everyone. They're producing gateways that are a source of great pride. They're creating schools and community centers. And they're doing it at very low cost. The women will cook food and prepare things, except for the women who are actually helping do the construction. And it's a community party. And the kids take, take part in it to the extent they can. And everybody, it's a big social happy gathering. And at the end of it, a lot of people are well fed and there's a school where there wasn't a school previously. And the other thing that is poorly understood is that the social space of these alleys actually produces a, an intertwined community uh, not that is important economically. So this, uh, this one house, self-produced house, it's located on a main walkway. And so they're in a good position to sell things. And they sell things to everyone. Uh, and they, they supply food and phone cards and uh, whatever is needed in that community in a very flexible manner. So people don't have to go out and buy things at 7-Eleven. They can buy things from their neighbors. The other thing that happens is, wow, this projector is bad. Uh, but as this researcher went through and got the stories of everyone, everyone who lives there, they live there, but they also have a business. They do the laundry for their neighbors, or they build furniture, or they weave uh, the carpentry, they make, they make furniture, they, uh, they make food, they make one dish every day, they make it really well, and uh, they sell it to the office workers who leave their offices, walk down into, through the gate of the compound, and they, they purchase the delicious food that is made in that place. And it's a wonderful symbiotic system where uh, the, the formal economy of the city uh, and the informal economy uh, of the self-produced communities work together and they need each other. A lot of the government officials that were involved in the work I was doing uh, around housing and architecture, they would wear the government uniforms and they worked in air-conditioned offices and then they lived in these communities. This is where they lived. It was a great source of affordable housing for even uh, people with 
fancy jobs in high-rise office buildings. So there's a lot of details I'm leaving out. Um, this is uh, Alejandro Echeverri, the architect of the Parque Explora project. Uh, and uh, other architects that are quite, and my bodyguard translator. Um, this, this is when we went through uh, Petare Norte in Caracas and then Medellin, Colombia in 2009. And just trying to figure out some of these brilliant moves that come out of the um, come out of the, uh, the survival methods and the just practical matter of self-production of communities. So when in 2004 um, there was an earthquake that registered 9.3 on the Richter scale on the day after Christmas in 2004. And I was asleep in a camper van on the beach in California, and I woke up. Fortunately, the tsunami didn't hit the coast of California. Um, but I woke up and I thought, oh, this is horrible. This town in Sumatra has been absolutely wiped out. And I said, oh, but that has nothing to do with me. Not my problem. Uh, and I lived my life that day, the day after Christmas. Uh, with my family and my wife's family. And then I went to bed and then the next morning I woke up again. And the first thought I had was, oh, damn, this is my problem. Uh, and so within, a, within two weeks, I was on a flight and I was there and um, surveying the damage and trying to figure out what to do next. I was part of the thousands of, of foreigners who flocked there to try to figure out what to do. And what we decided to do, a bunch of us, was to bring the methods of self-produced neighborhoods to the rebuilding of these communities. These communities were not self-produced. These communities were not impoverished. These communities had title deeds. These communities had building permits. These communities had wealth and they had proper structures. Uh, but the government records were destroyed. And the, the, the government first said, no one's allowed to live within two kilometers of the coast anymore. And uh, within days, chain link fence went up and said, this property is now reserved for this luxury resort. Uh, one after the other, the corporate uh, real estate development claimed this property that was unbuildable. Uh, and the survivors were kicked off their property with no compensation. And these property developers said, coastline, it's, it's empty, it's available to us. And the Japanese aid organization said, oh, we're gonna build a freeway through this property. Uh, finally, we've cleared out this bottleneck so we can build this huge freeway through this whole area that you saw on the map. And so the government quickly backtracked and they said, okay, we take it back. You can rebuild where you were, but you have to rebuild properly. And since we lost all property records, this, the same team of five to seven people who were plotting out the property land before the tsunami, it's gonna take them 40 or 50 years to reestablish the boundaries of your property before you can rebuild, just be patient. And so there are 200,000 people who were killed in this and the survivors, uh, lost their homes. They lost. They needed about 150,000 homes very quickly. So me and the group that I was working with uh, used the method of mobilizing the survivors. The survivors were mostly men between the ages of 15 and 50 because they were either strong enough to swim during the tsunami or they were out on the fishing boats and the wave came through and under the fishing boats and wrote, lifted the fishing boats but it's when the wave hit the coastline that it built up to a 60 foot wall of water that destroyed uh, the, the communities and they lost um, a majority of the people who were on shore. Um, so these guys were sitting in tents, getting stung by mosquitoes and being depressed and have nothing to do. We mobilized them with the help of the local university and said, okay, everybody, here's the satellite position 
we used uh, GIS and uh, technology uh, to help them map their own plots. We taught them how to triangulate and do the math. And we established the boundaries, which allowed them to then do another thing called land readjustment, which is an idea that we brought from the US to Indonesia. And uh, the step one is they figure out who owns what property and everyone gets the same percentage, but some space is taken out to improve the infrastructure. So the theme of this was build back better. And so we have wider streets, uh, access to uh, water sanitation. And uh, we showed them that you could do it in a lot of different ways. You could bring families together. Uh, it was a, a Muslim, very devout, the most devout Muslim community in Indonesia, in the majority Islamic uh, nation. Uh, and they taught us, said, well, you can't have people building on the same land where they were before, because that would result in a patchwork of houses isolated away from their neighbors, because so many people died. And a lot of people were too afraid. A lot of the survivors were too afraid to come back and rebuild in the village. So we figured out a way to ensure everyone's property rights are respected. All the survivors maintain their property rights and they move the location of their property so that they can be adjacent to the mosque and adjacent to neighbors who were all planning on rebuilding. And so this approach, this planning approach, which is a trick that comes out of uh, the informal settlement self-production, uh, we brought it to bear. Uh, at the same time, the Australian engineers in weekly meetings were telling us uh, we need to alert the Indonesian government. We need to get the army and with rifles protecting this land to make sure no one rebuilds. That's what they were concerned about. It's these Australian engineers and US engineers were saying, we have to stop people from rebuilding. Why? Because they won't build it right. People won't build it properly uh, to code and it will fall in the next uh, earthquake. So we made a, we published a comic book. And the comic book in the local language teaches people how to build properly. What is the proper sand, Portland cement, water mix to create strong concrete? How, what size rebar do you use? What type of rebar do you use? How do you tie it? What's the spacing? How do you keep it on chairs from being on the bottom of the board? We, it's a comic book that teaches uh, non-professional builders how to build. And they're not dumb. And they, they grabbed it up and they learned how to build. And the governor of Aceh caught wind of what we were doing and the head of the rebuild, rebuilding process. These are students from MIT, Rhode Island School of Design, Tufts, there were no Wentworth students, but we had a big uh, event at MIT, a workshop on building back after disaster. And we said, who wants to go to Sumatra and help rebuild? And we had 60 people interested. And as they went to their universities, they said um, three things. No, you can't have college credit for doing this, even though you're being led by a PhD professor in architecture. Uh, no, you can't have financial support for doing this, even though it's profound educational experience. And by the way, if, you, if we find out that you go to Sumatra, and even if you claim that you're going on vacation, we might have to kick you out of college if we find out you went. They were so afraid of the legal liability uh, that was connected with that. So. We were very disappointed, but there were still 15 students who said, we don't care, we're going anyway. I'll drop out of school if I have to, we're going. So we went. And uh, it was successful. The head of the Build Back Better uh, is credited with uh, 
the fastest, highest quality reconstruction after disaster ever. He embraced our model of self-construction as a model. He said, we're going to make uh, August 2005 was declared to be a village planning month after the model that we produced. And they put it out and they spread it to um, 600 different villages. Uh, and, and the result was dramatic that we had people designing skate shelters that doubled as mosques. And then five years later, uh, the engineers actually built it. And this is um, the, the town that we were working in, is this one, this is before the tsunami. And this is uh, in the year 2021, this is what it looked like in Google Earth. It's rebuilt. There's, there's not as many people living there yet, uh, but uh, the families, everyone remarried very quickly and started having babies and there's been a baby boom. And it's a very hopeful, optimistic place now uh, because we were able to bring, in part because we were able to bring these methods from self-produced neighborhoods to something that previously was never a slum and it's not a slum now. It's a wonderful, viable community because we were able to use the tools of architecture and planning to mobilize the community to help build their own communities back. Even when it was illegal, uh, it was illegal uh, for these aid institutions to give the people uh, materials. So uh, they found a way to just, they would just bring the trucks in and they would just drop the materials and leave and counting on the locals to know what to do with them. And that was the approach we took. Questions about that? Yeah. Well, we didn't finish it. I mean, you and. Well, it was ongoing. Um, we, I made a visit, a scouting visit in January 2005. Uh, it was just uh, two weeks between semesters. And then I went back and helped teach this course at MIT. And then we went back as soon as the semester ended and we spent June and part of July there doing this work with the one, with the one community. And um, we shared the model and it just uh, took on a life of its own. We left and the construction carried on. It took about five years to really reestablish the community back in its original location. Anything else? So there are things we can do and it's surprising when it happens sometimes because it seems so unlikely that anything like that would ever happen. Um, does anyone know where this is? It's Shanghai. And which Wentworth faculty member designed this? Mark Cluffer. How'd you hear about that? Uh, he was my yeah, Mark Clapper's design firm designed the redevelopment of this very, very important and very famous uh, coastal facility that's called the Bund. And that's kind of where a lot of the history we're about to talk about happens is on the Bund. So here are the four topics. We're not going to get to everything. Um, there's the first thing we're going to do is I'm just going to show you the pictures that go with the reading. Uh, for those of you who did the reading of um, Orange County Java about how the the 
um, the U.S. real estate development model, specifically the California, specifically the Southern California real estate development model, was embraced and brought to Indonesia as the template for how they could mobilize. A, they created a real estate industry from nothing. Originally, the land had very low value, and it was exchanged between neighbors and villagers for various reasons having to do with marriages and deaths and inheritances. And it was just a means to an end. The reason we buy and sell land in that scenario is so that the young families have a place to build a home and raise a family. And so it's all about the use value of the land. It's nothing but use value. But what the real estate industry, the real estate economy of Southern California mobilizes is this other thing, which is exchange value. So these are two very important uh, terms that uh, are important to understand, to understand how the mechanisms of real estate finance operate and to understand why last week's topic was so important about um, why is it that housing costs so much more than people can afford. Don't the housing prices have to come down? Don't the housing prices have to stay connected to people's ability to purchase? The answer is no, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because the exchange value, that people buy houses not just for the use value of having a place to live, near, you know, within reasonable commuting distance uh, to school and work and, every, and community. The other reason people buy housing and real estate is for the exchange value. And that's the, this is the driver of the real estate economy and the driver of housing prices. This is why even though you are going to end up on the winning side of the economy when you graduate. You're gonna be among the highest paid architecture as graduates in history. And still, it's gonna feel crazy. Like We're gonna do this in a few weeks. We're gonna figure out how much you're gonna make and how much real estate you can buy. Let's say you marry each other and you have two income households. That's a lot of money. What kind of a house can you afford? And where is it gonna be? Right, we're gonna look at that. And your optimism is gonna be dampened a certain amount. I'm sorry about that. But it's one of the things that you are participating in and you more than other people have the ability to make a difference because you're architects. Okay. So the exchange value that is released by the economic miracle of Indonesia starting in the 70s under the, there was a military coup in 1965, The Year of Living Dangerously is a great movie, Sigourney Weaver, Mel Gibson. So, the takeaway from this, because we don't have time, the takeaway from this is that the Dutch planners in the 1970s identified three different models, three different development models. This is the, the uh, new town model where you build satellite cities around Jakarta and you put in green buffer zones to protect it. And then you connect these with uh, freeways. And this is kind of a British town planning model. And it's a recipe for sprawl. And the Dutch said, don't do this. And then they said, instead, you could do these corridors of infrastructure that lead these fingers of green. So you have this kind of a model. Infrastructure, urban development, and green open space between those fingers, much better. But Ultimately, uh, there will, if you put uh, roads there and then fingers will fill up because it's very difficult to control development. 
And instead they said, here's what you should do. You should build a new major city here, and a major city here, and put all your infrastructure in this corridor. Maybe one spur here does not already exist, but put high-speed train is the key. Put your train here and put your freeway, but you're gonna have a freeway. So put your freeway there, protect the sensitive coastline, because it's prone to flooding. There's lots of mangrove forest there. Preserve the coastline to prevent uh, collapse of the city. And keep, as long as you make all the infrastructure here, that's where the building will occur because you need roads and, and sewers and water supply and electricity. If you put your infrastructure here, that's where things will happen. It's a brilliant recipe for development, something you should remember. But a strange thing happens. Every 10 years, they publish a new version of this plan. And every 10 years in the introduction, they say, don't do the new town satellite model. That will lead to sprawl. The finger model is only slightly better. That will lead to sprawl. You need to do the infrastructure corridor model. Every year, they publish the report and reinforce those same three paradigms. But by the time you get to chapter three of the report, they're saying, okay, based on that analysis, we're going to do a concentric ring road pattern with new towns sprinkled throughout this ring road system. So even though it said exactly what not to do, that's exactly what they did do. Why? Because the president's family is in the business of building freeways. And the friends of the president's family are in the business of mobilizing millions and millions of dollars through real estate speculation. And so these are the new towns of around Jakarta, you can't really see it, including this huge water supply uh, catchment area that was preserved. And and thus, because it was protective wilderness, it was available to become the new capital city of Indonesia. And so they said, this is where the capital is going to move to. Uh, when Suharto left power in the, the economic collapse in 97, uh, they abandoned this plan. And now, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there's a new capital city under construction on the island of Borneo. That's a whole other story. And so how does this real estate uh, empire work? It works by emulating the cultural, uh, the culturally attractive attributes of the United States. Pretty cool, huh? So the, here's the pictures that were in the reading, but just it's a little clearer. The architects, the architects who are designing these places took the same history of architecture classes that you took. Well, not quite as good, but they learned about Mount Rushmore. They learned about the Lac de Triomphe in France. So they sell real estate by saying, you can live in a neighborhood that is a replica of the United States. You can live in a neighborhood that is like visiting Paris. You can live in a neighborhood that is like visiting Florence. You recognize this one? I think it's 1514 Brunelleschi's Dome. I was gonna say these types of communities are actually These types of communities are really common in Thailand. Too. I don't know why. India, China, increasingly, Outside every city in the global south, there are real estate developments that follow this model. So every culture that we study in architecture school is available to become like a cartoon version of itself in these communities. Can can you listen to the question here that Jesse has? So it's just to kind of drive because people's pockets are involved. 
and that's why they use like more centralized and rather than the transit one. Mm -hmm. So why did these want to use it rather than if they're like why did these so um the new town concentric model is based on using cars to get everywhere okay. which is another topic we're going to go in depth on and it's because this is how the united states presents itself to the world as a model for emulation even though this is an emulation of the Issei Shrine in Japan, it's using a set of tools that were pioneered and perfected in Southern California in the real estate development around Los Angeles. And the real estate industry of Indonesia prided itself on being an extension of the US real estate industry, the top architects slash developers of the Indonesian real estate community were members of the US real estate development organizations. And they went to the same meetings, even to the point where uh, one developer that I talked to uh, got fed up with his architects and said, you guys don't get it. I went to school in LA. I understand what the architecture in LA is like. Enough is enough. He, he, took everyone in the architecture firm, put them into his private jet and flew them to LA. And they pretended to be shopping for real estate. They got into a house, they paid off the real estate broker saying, can you just disappear for an hour? And then they, the architects with their tape measures and their cameras, they measured every detail of the house that they were visiting. And so they could understand what a proper Southern California real estate product looks like in every detail. And then they got back on the jet, they flew back to Indonesia. And as you know from the reading and from the sketch writing, they didn't exactly replicate it. They made it look like the US on the outside, but on the inside, they adapted it to Indonesian lifestyles. Yes, Ryan. Isn't that is it a form of neo-colonialism when the Indonesians are the ones aggressively doing it? I think it's a valid question. I don't know the answer. Um, is there a reason they're doing it? Yeah, I feel like it's bad just copying someone else's architecture when you can develop your own. So I think it, it's answered in the next few slides. So this is Photoshop. If this is when Photoshop was new. You take photos from some other place and you collage it together, even with uh, people who don't look like our clients here in Indonesia, but it's attractive as a buyer to buy into this lifestyle. I can be as good as uh, someone in the United States. Here's Rodeo Drive in Jakarta. <laughs> It doesn't look like Rodeo Drive uh, in LA, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be an exact replica in order to make, to be attractive marketing for the wealthiest 5%. Remember Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. Uh, you only need 5% of the population to have enough money to purchase these things. And you've got a huge market. The other thing is that makes the market larger is Indonesia is concerned about housing all its citizens, all these compounds, you know, it's very poor housing. So they created a mortgage uh, subsidy program the way the US has a mortgage subsidy program. That's how our parents and your grandparents purchased real estate is by getting a subsidized mortgage. And so they created a mortgage subsidy program but instead of going to the majority of the population that needed it, it went, it was a tool used by the wealthiest 5% to invest in real estate. So I rode my bicycle outside of town, you know, through the rice fields for hour, you know, for an hour. I arrive at this community and it's like a ghost town. And I saw someone playing in the garden. 
And so I went up to him and I said, hey, do you live here? And he said, no. And I said, well, who lives here? And he said, uh, no one. And I said, what do you mean? And he explained to me how when a wealthy family has a baby, they buy a house. And when they have another baby, they buy a house. And then they hire a gardener and a housekeeper and they hire a crew to keep it looking nice and maintain the value. And they take turns sleeping so no one breaks in and steals the copper pipes and sells the copper pipes because it's very expensive. And so it remains empty except for the caretakers year after year after year. And then when the babies grow up and it's time for them to get married, they sell the house and pay for the wedding and set up the, the newlyweds in a new house, but not here. Who would ever live here? This is not a place for people to live. This is exchange value housing. This is an investment that's there to gain in value over the 20 years it takes for the child to grow up. And then you sell it and you set up the young family. You do it again when the daughter is ready to get married. You sell the house and you set them up. And someone else buys it, but no one ever lives here. It's an investment. This is an exchange value. And the reason this is useful is that uh, it sets us up for understanding what happens in China. So this is, I uh, can't see it. So uh, what happens in China? Well, China, historically, you may recall from History 32, I'm not sure if you look at this, but the British, the British Empire got addicted to tea. Just love, love, love tea. But where does tea come from? China. And so the British said, in order to buy the tea from China, the British had to sell something to China so that they had the currency to purchase the tea. And so the British said, hey guys, we've got this industrial revolution. We produce the highest quality cloth that you've ever seen. China said, we got that, you're not interested. And one thing after another, the Chinese said, we don't need any of that, right? So what did the British do? They grew opium in their other colony, India, and they sold that opium to the population of China getting the population addicted. Did you study this in your global? It's a chilling story. I'm filling in blanks that I'm leaving here. When the Chinese government said, whoa, 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 hey, wait a minute, you can't do this. Uh, the, the British uh, you know, said, this is an act of war. And long story short, the Opium Wars of 1840 resulted in the Treaty of Nanjing. And China, you know, the British Navy was the best in the world. And they uh, it resulted in the international powers dividing up uh, the, the city of Shanghai uh, and other cities, Guangzhou, which was Canton, um, Hong Kong. Uh, so the colonial powers on the pretext of this war, were able to, they never colonized China, but they humiliated China. China has not forgotten. Uh, and China has, this is the Bund, uh, under international uh, control, and built some of the uh, best and tallest um, U.S. skyscrapers in the world were built uh, in Shanghai by U.S. builders and U.S. architects and others. The French were very much involved. And so this became a source of humiliation um, for China. So the Chinese uh, have their pride. And as uh, they, they rose in the world, um, long story short, Mao Zedong died in 1975. His successor, um, Dao Deng Xiaoping opened up to the West and said, um, we're now open for business. We're gonna embrace capitalism with socialist characteristics. So there's, they joined the capitalist system, but they, instead of being 
monopoly capitalism that is the US style, it's state sponsored capitalism. So there's always a state component. And so the state said, it's great that London, Tokyo, and New York are these global capitals of commerce. We're gonna make Shanghai the fourth capital of global commerce. And so what do you do when you're trying to establish your city as the capital of global commerce? You call the architects. And so they brought in the architects. There's an international design competition. And the architects said, uh, well, we could do a version of Manhattan here. So they photocopied Manhattan. And they said, what would that look like? And they said, okay, we could do Venice, the city of Venice to scale in Shanghai. Or Paris, we could do, we could give you Paris. We have something in your size. Uh, and so we had uh, a global competition, not surprisingly, um, all the star architects of the world were part of this competition, but the award went to the Chinese team. And they then took the best ideas of the competition and incorporated it into the design of Pudong, which was the Manhattan financial district across the river from the Bund of Shanghai. This is the historic city of Shanghai. This is the Bund that developed under European control. And this is Pudong, which became the location of five or six of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. So before there was Dubai, there was Shanghai. <clears throat> so on the road to becoming the dominant global superpower, what is China to do about the 500 million? That's more than the population of the United States. 500 million inadequately housed Chinese citizens. <clears throat> and so they take the same strategies that we saw in Indonesia and they deploy them to develop very fancy architecture. And it becomes, uh, no one wants, everyone buys it, but no one wants to live there. So it becomes a very popular place for wedding photos. And that's what it does some of these towns very famously. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered what it might be like if you were the last person on earth? Your ghost Well, cities. I imagine that it would be something like this. And I've got to tell you, it is a very strange and eerie feeling. Everything is here, an entire city, all the buildings, the roads, That's schools, hospitals, here. you name it. Everything that is, except the people. So they have everything around, except for people. There is not a soul to be seen. <laughs> so have you heard of the ghost cities city in China? Called Lingang, an hour's drive from Shanghai, built for nearly a million people. So they build cities as a real estate development uh, project, but, the, but people can't afford to buy and live in these cities, but they, they are somehow mobilizing financial capital based on the existence of these cities. The few people who are able to afford to move into these cities, uh, they can't afford the electricity bill. So they can't run a refrigerator, they can't run their stove, they can't run their washing machines. So they live on the 30th floor, but they have no electricity. Uh, and they wash their clothes in the drainage canal. They fish and get food from the local landscape. So they're basically squatters in these, in these cities. And uh, the internet is filled with depictions of these cities that have no people in it. What is going on here? This is the exchange value that is driving. This is 100% exchange value with no use value. There's no usable anything in any of this place, but maybe someday there is. So just the story you have to, in order for the exchange value to hold water, is you have to imagine that someday this is gonna have people and it is gonna have use value. And believe it or not, that it does. Eventually, people will move here, but it won't be in the numbers that they need. And so, uh, this is what happens. 
So they build all these cities and sometimes they make the decision they built too much and it threatens to uh, collapse the, the bubble, the housing bubble. So the only, you know, housing bubbles are horrible, but the only thing worse than a housing bubble is having your housing bubble burst. That's what happened in 2007 with the economic recession. Um, and so to protect the housing market, sometimes, uh, and this was, I think, the largest case, they have to uh, take the, uh, the buildings that they've spent so much money to build, and in order to maintain the value of what's, what's remaining, they have to destroy it. Crazy, right? So, so the challenge for you guys is how do you take these forces and uh, make sense of it? Do you have time for this? And so this is, um, this is, we only have a minute or two. This is the punchline. So it seems hopeless and we seem helpless because the whole world has been driven crazy by creating these fantastical uh, cartoon versions of US culture. Now that's either uh, the, the source of hopelessness or if you are, if you know what martial artists do, like what does a martial artist do? What do they do in karate and jujitsu? They take the force of the, of the ch challenge and they channel it and flip it on its head so that the force that's coming at you, that's threatening you, gets channeled to be something good. So the key thing is that in the last few moments, when the United States still is presenting the world with the blueprint for what their future looks like, uh, the winners of the Global South uh, the, to the extent that they are building, they're envisioning the future for themselves and their country. They are building it out of the building blocks supplied and broadcast via TikTok and advertising on the internet every day out of the United States and into the rest of the world. They know about the same football stars. They know about the same basketball stars. They know about friends. They watch the same sitcoms that we watch and they are paying attention. They are constructing the future of the world based on the image of what the consumption model of the United States looks like. So who has control over determining what is cool in the United States? It's the architects, it's the designers, it's you guys. If you can make it cool to be more responsible, if you can make it cool to uh, not, uh, if you make it cool to go green, then the US population is not significant enough. You can convince everyone in the United States and it would not alter significantly the course of the world, except the whole world is paying attention to what you guys are producing. That is the jujitsu move. If you can make it cool, you can make it big. And that's the thing that will turn it around, okay? Time's up. Anyone who wants to talk about anything, hang back. Uh, good luck with your analysis. <clears throat>